Hi. I'm so excited to be sitting here with Jessica, who's one of our top female founders in the 8BC portfolio. It's so fun as a female investor to be sitting here with a woman who's solving such a big problem. And so I thought we'd kick off by talking a little bit about what that problem is and how Ubiome is solving it. Absolutely, yeah, I'm really excited to be here too. Really grateful to the team at Slush and everyone here who's listening to the talks. I've heard some great talks here too. Um, so what we do at Ubiome is we sequence the human microbiome, which are the trillions of bacteria and other organisms that live on and in our bodies. And you might think, well, why do we care about bacteria that are in our bodies? And isn't that kind of gross? And why would we care about that? And basically, bacteria are involved and other microorganisms live on and in us, all over us, in our skin, in our noses, in our gut. And they have an effect, a massive effect on our health. Almost every chronic illness is related to the microbiome. So everything from cancer and diabetes to more minor things like acne or dandruff, and also acute illnesses like the, those commonly studied in infectious disease are also part of the microbiome. So what we do at Ubiome is to gather really large data set. We have the largest data set in the world of microbiomes. We do this in collaboration with over 200 researchers around the world at Harvard and Stanford and Oxford and all sorts of places. And we take all this data and we use it to make clinical tests drug targets, and a lot of other things that can help us take advantage of this new emerging science of the microbiome. What's really exciting about this is that the science isn't very old. It's only about, you know, the, the word microbiome was coined maybe 15 years ago. The first studies of the microbiome were done maybe 10 years ago. So we're really at the forefront of commercializing this new technology and making it available to everyone. Can you tell us a little bit more about how big that data set is and how big the next largest data set is, just to give the audience and everyone a sure. picture of that? Yeah, so we have almost a quarter of a million microbiomes. Um, if you think about the human genome, some of the largest data sets of the human genome are only about a million, and the human genome is about you know, 20 years ahead of where the microbiome is. Some of the other data sets, they're in the, they're in the several thousands, or so at least 10x greater, uh, sorry, at least 20x greater than the other data sets that are out there. And what this data allows us to do is apply some really sophisticated technology. You know, we filed, uh, we have six issued patents, over 100 applied for patents, and we've just done a lot of really interesting things with this data. Um, we're using machine learning and artificial intelligence and some algorithms that we've developed to be able to better understand what, what these bugs are doing in us and how they can affect our health. That's a lot of poop. That's a lot of poop, yeah. So part of this, part of this gig as CEO of Ubiome is, to be, is that I get to make a lot of poop jokes, and we have a lot of fun around the office talking about poop. But uh, you know, all joking aside, it's, it's really funny how we, we think of poop as sort of this waste product, which it is, obviously, but it's also this goldmine of information that can help us improve our health. That must have been really challenging, and you know, I was in obviously some of those pitch meetings talking to investors about this product and how it works. Yeah, right, to all the entrepreneurs out there, you think you have some tough pitches? <laughs> you walk into a boardroom with you know, 20 people in it, all very proper, all in suits, and then you start talking about poop with them. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, you know, it's an experience, but I think, I think what's, what investors see that's valuable is that this is a really important, mm -hmm. understudied area, and that we were the very first company in the space, mm -hmm. and what we can do is, is make some things that are really valuable and important, not only from a business perspective, but all from, also from a scientific and societal perspective as well. So just pulling back to the launch of Ubiome, you launched this business off of a crowdfunding campaign. Um, and th there was, I think what's important, I think you say a lot is citizen science in Ubiome. And talk about how that crowdf crowdfunding campaign and citizen science tie in to this mission and, and how you sort of push Ubiome forward. That's such a good question. So for all those out there who are doing crowdfunding campaigns, I, I I feel you. Um, crowdfunding is like the bungee jumping of entrepreneurship. You just, all of a sudden you have a page and then you have customers and they all want things from you and they all think of questions and answers that you never would have, ways to use your product, you never would have thought of yourself. So I actually really recommend it as a way of starting a company because it's a great way to see that if there is a market for what you're doing to kind of understand your customers and do customer development kind of on the lead startup model really quickly. Um, we started that way because we weren't sure. I mean, at that point, there was no such thing as commercialization of the microbiome. We were the very first company, so we just had no idea if anyone would want this or would care about this. Yeah. So um, the NIH in the U.S., the National Institutes of Health, which is, kind of, which is the big government scientific funding body in the U.S. for health, had done this project, this $173 million project, 
um, over five years. They looked at the microbiome. Um, this was supposed to be the, like, the groundbreaking study, kind of equivalent to the Human Genome Project. And they, they spent all this money, and they studied 242 people. And my background, I got my PhD at Oxford in data analysis, you know, sort of computer science of large, uh, focused on large social science data sets. And my thought was, well, what? I mean, how can you look at 242 people? What if you had 2,500 people? What if you had 250,000? What yeah. if you had 2 million? Yeah. What if you had 250 million? What would you be able to do and what would you be able to learn? So we started the crowdfunding campaign, my co-founder and I, because we we thought, well, let's see what happens if we gather, let's see if we can gather that kind of data set, and if we can, let's see what we can do with it. So it's still online if anyone wants to look at it. It's a little embarrassing now. So we showed it to some of our That's employees great. the other day, and they were like, you look so young. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, I, Thank I did. You. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thanks for that. That was amazing. Uh, so anyway, so we did this crowdfunding campaign. And, you know, I, I really recommend it. We, we learned a lot from our customers. We had to grow really quickly as entrepreneurs and, you know, figure out all sorts of uses for our product, answer people's questions, customer support, pricing, all these things kind of flew yeah. at us. And it was really great. Like, I, I think it was a really good experience. But it also is kind of grounded in the fundam fundamental values of Ubiome, which yeah. are related to ad advancing science as quickly as possible. And the way to do that is by involving the public. So, you know, I'm surprised more companies don't do this because I think it's a really valuable way to not only find out if people want and like your product, yeah. but also, you know, really engage with the public and from a scientific and a societal sort of giving back perspective to, to involve the public in science. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that really struck me about the way science is done, because my background's in academia, um, even if not in the, in the biological field, was how long it takes for a scientific discovery that is peer reviewed, that everyone agrees is good solid science to turn into something that people can use. Yeah. And citizen science is one way of really accelerating that. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about the, you made this jump from at that point when you were doing your crowdfunding campaign, you were still very much in academia. You were very much in your PhD still. I was still finishing my what, PhD, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is that, what's that yeah. jump from academia to you know, being a founder like, and, and how should other people really do that? That's a great question. So for anyone out in the audience who's a PhD, I, I sympathize, I, I've been there. Um, I, think, I think the big difference is, um, Obviously involving speed, involving mm -hmm. values, involving kind of engagement with the public mm -hmm. in the way that you do as an entrepreneur, but you don't do as a, you don't, although I think you should, you don't commonly do as an academic. Mm -hmm. I think um, the most important thing that I learned in this transition was this kind of switch in focus from a, you know, publication and sort of resume focus the lot of academics have, where it's all about getting in the right paper, you know, getting the right paper in the right publication versus engaging with the people, with the public, with your customers, with your other stakeholders to give people something they actually want. And I, I think that it's beneficial to academic science in general to, to take a much more kind of democratized focus and try to better, try to see what you can do to make your science have an impact as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Citizen science is one way to do that. There are many other ways of doing that. But one way, citizen science is one way to say, you know, let's involve the public, let's make the science go faster, and let's also, you know, make the science more useful. And you know pretty quickly if it's not applicable to people, because people don't like it. If you do science, it doesn't actually help them or yeah. benefit them in some way. So how is, speaking about that actionability and like, creating science that does help the public in some way. Can you talk a little bit about what the Ubiome, first, I guess, smart gut, and now newly minted, Jessica launched a, a new test, a, a women's health test that's really moving women's health you know, forward, really exciting for all of us gals um, out there. What is, what is the actionability of these tests? What does that look like? That's, that's a really good question. So a lot of people who are familiar with the science say, oh, but the microbiome's not there yet. Wait another 10 years. Let's slow everything down and wait till we get there. But I, I think that in the meantime, people don't get the benefit of the science that's already been done and is already well, well understood. And as entrepreneurs, one of, our, one of our roles is to accelerate the process of translational medicine, of moving the science from a peer-reviewed journal into something that people can use. Mm -hmm. So we did that fairly quickly. So we launched the company in 2012. We did the crowdfunding campaign at the very end of 2012. We had a product, which was a consumer health and wellness product in the market in early 2013. 
Um, it's, we still have it. It's called Explore. It's available all around the world. You can order it in Finland or anywhere else in Europe or anywhere else in the world for that matter. Mm -hmm. And it's to help you better understand how your microbiome affects your, affects your gut. You know, how does the food you eat affect your microbiome? The probiotics you bought last week at the health food store, are those actually in your gut? Are they there? But we, we realized that there were a lot of things that we wanted to be able to tell people, but we couldn't tell them except in a medical context because these are, because there are a lot of clinical applications of the microbiome and we wanted to, to be able to, to tell people about them and to actually make products that took advantage of that. So mm -hmm. one thing, so we came out with our first product about a year ago, it's called Smart Gut for people who have chronic um, gut conditions, so have IBD, IBS, Crohn's, leaky gut, things like that. And it's a way to distinguish between these conditions and then track them over time. And we have a new product we just came out with a couple weeks ago. Super excited about this. So I keep getting this question, like, why did you launch a product for women? And I'm like, why wouldn't you launch a product for women? Like, because we're we not half human of beings? everyone. Yeah. I don't know. Like, <laughs> do we have health? Do we need healthcare? Yes. <laughs> so um, the product is called Smart Chain. It's a um, it's a women's health test. It screens for um, HPV, which is associated with cervical cancer. Um, sexually transmitted diseases and vaginal flora, and does this all with a with a um, swab you can do at home. So it's way more convenient. It's ordered by doctors, so it's a clinical test, but it's really something a woman can use at home. It's we get we get emails all the time from people say, you know, this was embarrassing, but I can do it by myself. You know, I didn't want to have to go back to my doctor for yet another test. I did my regular exam, but now I want to do another test. And I don't want to have to go back just to do a test, so I can do this at home. So we've gotten some really fantastic feedback, and I think that these are the first in a very long line on this platform that of technology that we've built, of new clinical tests that make it so where we can do a test that used to take, you know, 10 different tests. We can do it all in one. We can do a test that you had to have at the doctor's office. You can do yourself in your own home. And also building this kind of, you know, internet-like, you know, user experience, right? So yeah. you have a, a website that's informative and engaging. And, you know, we've talked a lot, everyone, I've heard some other talks in the healthcare field here at Hitslash and at other places about how healthcare is just not designed with a user experience in mind. Like how many of you go to a doctor's office and you're yeah. like, this is an amazing experience. I recommend <laughs> it to everyone. That just never happens. And our goal is to give our patients and our doctors a really good user experience, like the kind you expect when you log on to any other online system where it's, it's focused around you and the goal is to give you the experience you need. Yeah. So we've done that with the two clinical tests that we have now and we have a, a long line of other tests that we're gonna be launching. We also have some interesting drug discovery targets and mm -hmm. other things, but the goal is that we, we take this data and we use it to make things that are useful to people um, based, grounded very strongly in the scientific literature. Our tests have, you know, we have like, 200 references on our smart get test that really kind of clearly show, we show our work in terms of the science, but we try to bring it to people as soon as possible. Yeah. So one of the things that we're really excited about and talk about often at HBC is our bio-IT thesis, kind of the convergence between biology and computer science. And Ubiome really puts a, you know, sort of exclamation point on our bio-IT thesis. And I think yeah. it's true in you specifically because your background is really in math and um, your PhD, you know, is, is more on that side than it is on, you know, the sort of biology side. And so talk about sort of the importance of, you know, you, you started to talk about it earlier, but dig in to the importance of of data and computation and AI in you biome and more broadly in science. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. So yeah, when we when we heard your thesis, we thought, well, that's great because that's our thesis too. You know, <laughs> that's exactly it. Is this this convergence that's happening? Um, one of our other investors put this really well, where he said that things that used to be impossible are now cheap. Right, like it's DNA sequencing, which used to be this, you know, amazing dream that someday we might have this, and people would do their whole PhD thesis like 20, 30 years ago trying to sequence one gene and now you know it's way less expensive to do and really kind of possible to not only you know not only to make it cheap but to make it to make things that were impossible like the bacteria that we just didn't know lived on our bodies we can now analyze and for like $89 you can order an explorer kit and learn yeah. about them so there's this tremendous convergence of these two fields happening because biology as soon as you convert the sort of the atoms of biology into the bits of data, then you can take all the computer science skills that a computer scientist had and many people here have and, and use those same skills from whatever field on this biological data. Mm -hmm. So in terms of what we do with that, you know, we're using that to make these specific products that, you know, we 
find beneficial and have this clinical utility. But there are a lot of other applications that are possible for this, and I hope other people explore them because there's this you know, tremendous ability to take technology that could be used to make ads serve better or you know, things like that, that could instead be used to really improve human health and human life and really have an impact on the world. And that, that's why I got involved in this. You know, yeah. My background was not in biology, but I realized the same skills that I had could be applied in a field where I just, I go to work every day and I think like, wow, we're actually taking this science that people, first of all, it was like a new science that people just didn't even know about until didn't recently believe, and yeah. turning yeah. it into something real that people can use. Yeah, which is totally amazing. I mean, yeah. you could have really focused on any, with your background, you could have focused on any area of, yeah. you know, of science in general or any, you know, you could have focused on social media and those big data sets right. and really right. you chose this because it's, you know, it's, you were really the pioneers in this industry, which I think is really exciting. And yeah, I'm excited never, about that too. And yeah. I think I think that, you know, to the, to the audience, to anyone who's out there who has, I mean, a lot of computer scientists in the audience, definitely, this world of bio-IT is so fascinating and, you know, get involved in it because you can really, you know, the, the biology world cries out for computational skills. There are, ma there are really impactful things that you can do. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you, what do you feel like as an entrepreneur, you know, we, you and I met through another amazing entrepreneur, Elad Gill, the founder of Color Genomics, and, and that's how we came to be introduced. Um, I think great entrepreneurs and great scientists know other great entrepreneurs and scientists. What do you feel like is really exciting right now out, you know, in the world beyond you biome that you're seeing sort of on the ground? That's, that's such a good question. So I, I think there's sort of two, I mean, we're kind of at the convergence of two trends at Ubiome, mm -hmm. and I see other ways that those two trends can be applied. So one of them is around DNA sequencing. Like I was saying, you know, you have this, this you're turning all this, all this information that was not previously accessible at all, whether it's the microbiome, the genome, the transcriptome, the exome, all the omics, and also other, even just health IT data, even mm -hmm. just data that's locked in electronic medical records and yeah. isn't well analyzed, or pharmacy data, or health insurance data, all those things are kind of available to now be analyzed in new ways. So there's mm -hmm. kind of this sequencing leads to data, and then other data leads to data, and both those things, you know, you can apply these new computational techniques. Mm -hmm. And then I'd say the other thing is democratization of healthcare. This is something I'm really passionate about. You yeah. know, the healthcare system used to be the doctor is God, and tells you what to do, and mm -hmm. then you go do it like an automaton without any agency, and then either you are <laughs> compliant or you are not compliant. And that's just not the way the world works anymore. You go on Dr. Google and you know more, you know, you can do your own research, you go on Dr. Google Scholar and you read the scientific paper yourself and yeah. you draw your own conclusions. So I think that this democratization of healthcare is the most massive shift in, in healthcare, and I think it's 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 a product of having more information, so it's not going anywhere. And there are a lot of new ways to relate to the customer, who is now the patient rather than the doctor necessarily, mm -hmm. but also relate, do that in the context of the regulatory frameworks that you need to work within, the relationship with the doctor. So there, there are a lot of new things that are done in that space, and I really, I'm really excited about that. I think there'll be better outcomes for patients when we're mm -hmm. treated like people rather than like, you know, just kind of units within the healthcare system. Yeah, instead of a set of numbers, essentially. Yeah, exactly, a set yeah. of numbers, right? And you want to be, yeah. you know, we're, we're active agents in our own health. Yeah. And I think, I think that's really going to lead to some great transformations in the healthcare yeah. system. And I'd, better health outcomes. People yeah. will just be healthier. I bet you're a really annoying patient for your doctor. I'm so annoying. <laughs> I mean, actually, actually, I'm not annoying because yeah. I very carefully choose doctors yeah, who too. like it and who are like partners yeah. rather than doctors who are like, grr, you shouldn't know anything. Don't learn about your body. Stay yeah. ignorant. I'm, <laughs> I'm the same. I get to my doctor and I have like a list of things that I feel like are going on. I'm like, this is what I think. And then yeah, and you want a doctor yeah. and, you know, you also want a lab testing company or whatever, whoever else is involved, a health insurer, a microbiome whoever else, testing a company. microbiome, for example, um, you, you want a, you know, you want healthcare partners who encourage that mm -hmm. and engage with you and say, oh, but did you read this study? And yeah. oh, you know, here's another application of that rather than try to shut you down. So I think that the, the healthcare companies of the future will be partners rather than, um, you know, rather than kind of agents that just connect people together without keeping the agency of the people in mind. Yeah. So something I think that's fun that goes on inside of your office is people, you know, kind of do informal testing on their own microbiomes. And, um, you know, I even sometimes partake in this kind of testing. Like I 
did 10 days of straight soy lint and then tested my microbiome, <laughs> which was a really interesting result. Um, yes. What are some of the weirdest things you guys have done? Yeah, we've done some interesting things. So we had one very <laughs> dedicated early employee who went on a ketogenic diet. She ate nothing but butter for 10 days. I don't advise this for people, but this yeah. was just... Don't try this at home. Don't try this at home. <laughs> but it was really interesting because her, we could see the shifts in her microbiome fairly rapidly. It kind of, so the literature says, you know, after a few days of, you know, after a radical shift, your microbiome will, will switch over. It takes about two weeks for something that's more subtle, but if you make a rapid change, like you take antibiotics or you switch your diet radically to, you know, a totally different nutritional source, you'll, you'll have this change in your microbiome. And she did, she saw that. It was really interesting. After a few days, um, her, her microbiome shifted from carbohydrate digesting bacteria to fat digesting bacteria. And one of the things we have in our, in our product is analysis of the functions of the microbiome. So we can say not only do you have this bug, but this bug also has these genes for this specific type of metabolism, let's say, for fat metabolism, and you can see the shift. So wow. it's, really, it's really fascinating on you know, self-experiment for like health hacker types to do it. Yeah. But it's also useful in a medical context to say, wow, that's really interesting. You know, your, your microbiome is more correlated, for example, with prediabetes and obesity because of the type of bacteria that you have in your gut and what functions those genes have. Wow, that's <laughs> yeah. butter for how many days? Butter, it was 10 days of butter. Wow. I felt really bad for her, but yeah. she was very dedicated. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and I'm very impressed with her yeah, <laughs> in a lot too. of ways, not just in that way. That's so funny. <laughs> um, so just in general, I think there's, you know, I'm often getting the question as a, you know, kind of founder shifting into investing and, and you get this question, you know, as um, an academic shifting into being a founder. Um, but as both women, I think we often both get the question around what is it like to be a female kind of in our fields where, you know, they're super male dominated and, you know, you're pitching as mostly, except for with the exception of me and maybe a few others, all male investors. Very um, true. And look, we're almost out of time. No, yeah, just kidding. <laughs> um, what's so, that like? Give us a um, point on that. I think that there's a, I mean, that's a much longer conversation, I would say, but I say that there's a there are some advantages to being a female founder and there's some disadvantages, but I think the, I think the most important thing is to, is to lead with being a founder, right? Yeah. Like if you have, you know, the strength of your idea and you have the work that you've done, like don't discount that as a female and try not to be intimidated by some of the environments that you're put in, but mm -hmm. it's a much longer discussion and we will have to discuss yeah. it slash another time. And we're doing Q&A in the... Yeah, um, we're doing Q&A. Yeah, so if anyone's curious about that, I'm yeah. happy, to, uh, happy to answer. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys, Thank for you, everyone, listening. at Flesh. <laughs>